those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Larry Rader, and as you can guess from the uniform, I'm one of the observers. I'd like to talk to you this morning about the Sinai Bedouin, as opposed to the Bedouin of uh, Lawrence of Arabia. The Sinai Bedouin is a rather different animal. But first, a little bit about my qualifications to give you this lecture. I was born in this part of the world, I was born in Lebanon, lived there twice, lived in Egypt, Israel, Jordan. I worked in Middle Eastern topics over many, many years. Uh, chaired a think tank at the State Department on the Palestine question. And I've worked in every single Middle East crisis team at the State Department uh, from the Iran crisis all the way through to Libya. In fact, I came over here directly from the Libya task force. Ten years ago, I first became interested in Bedouins as a topic when I visited King Hussein in Jor of Jordan as his guest for a month. While there, I was introduced to a Bedouin girl and started dating her. She has a master's degree in art, is very Western, but also very much a Bedouin, and very different from the women you're going to find in the Sinai, who are also Bedouins. But I became interested in Bedouins at that time, and uh, I've been reading books about them over those 10 years and meeting other Bedouins in different parts of the Middle East. And then when I came here, the uh, observer force, they have, we have our own educational program for our own unit, and they wanted to set up a course on Bedouins. Because of my background, they asked me to research the Sinai Bedouins, which I'd already done a little bit of anyway. From all of that, you're probably going to say, well, this is an expert standing up here. I'm not an expert. And from my own studies, I don't believe there is such a thing as an expert on the Sinai Bedouin. There are a lot of people, British, French, particularly Israelis, who have spent a lot of time in the Sinai. And you're going to find that for every expert, so-called expert out here, on the Bedouins, you're going to have a different point of view as to who they are. You're going to find people who spend years with the same group of people as some other Western expert coming up with different conclusions as to who these people are outside our gates and down in the south. I do have a lot of faith in what I'm going to tell you today. It's based on a lot of in-depth research and interviews of Bedouins, discussions with Bedouin experts in Israel and Egypt, and uh, friends of mine in the field. But you should take everything you hear with a grain of salt, everything you read about the Bedouins with a grain of salt. They're very difficult people to understand, very interesting people nevertheless. Now, to the average Westerner, the Sinai Bedouin is a coarse, uneducated individual. I mean, you, know, you walk out there in the, in the, uh, outside the gate and you see the crawls and you go down to the southern part of the Sinai and you see the tents and you ask yourself, well, what sort of culture can these people have? And to uh, many city people in Egypt, they're a nuisance. They're thought not to have much aesthetic value and to be militarily insignificant. Now, I discovered that these are all misconceptions. Now, on the contrary, the Sinai Bedouin is pleased to help you out of the sand, share his last cup of coffee with you, so long as you obey his rules of behavior. And that's the critical point. You had to obey his rules of behavior. If you can do that, whether you're a woman or a man, you can deal with the Bedouins very effectively and very peacefully. The Sinai Bedouin is a modern representative of the remnants of an ancient culture, a people who brought Islam to the world in the sixth century and created an empire. He is proud of that history and recognizes that he was here before you were, and he's going to be here after you leave. You are the guests, he is the host, and he's very much aware of that role. And he's been the host to many people over thousands of years, to the Egyptians, to the Greeks, to the Romans, the Persians, the British, the French, you name it, the Israelis. He possesses a deep aesthetic sense, a love of poetry, art, and music, and a deep sense of honor. In addition, he has a long military history, the Sinai Bedouin, as a fierce fighter. And finally, he is an individual, a member of an exotic culture, perhaps, to us, but an individual with definite moral values and a sense of his place in the world that must be respected. And that last point is absolutely critical. He believes in himself as an individual and in his internal worth. He believes that he is at a high plane of culture, and in fact that we are on a lower plane of culture. And we have to understand that when we deal with them, whether we agree with it or not. Again, we are the foreign element here. We are the guests. Now, because the Bedouin has been in the region for thousands of years, they had to be considered indigenous to the Sinai. 
but in fact their roots come from Africa, Europe, and all over the Middle East. The pharaohs fought them when they were mining in this part of the Sinai. At Sarabad el Kadim, at Megara, Abu Bades, Abu Janima, Hamun Farun. Moses had his problems with the uh, Bedouins as well in the Wadi Faran in this area. If in fact, that was the route he took. We know he had troubles with the Bedouins, as mentioned in the Bible. The ancient word for Bedouin in Egyptian, Pharaonic Egyptian, is meshwesh, which means sand flea. Now that's a, a term which is over 4,000 years old and it describes the people in this peninsula. That attitude, sand flea, is a contemporary attitude held by city Egyptians. Not the peasants of the Nile Delta, who are people of nature, if you will, and get along very well with the Bedouins, but the city people of Egypt don't like the Bedouins very much and do think them as sand fleas. Now you'll find the Bedouins uh, derive, as I say, from the Europeans. If you go down to uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, you're going to find the Jebeliah Bedouins. Uh, they derive from uh, Romanian serfs and slaves brought there when they built the monastery. Not just Europeans, they were a mixture of Europeans and uh, the local Bedouins that have been there for several thousand years before that. You'll find in the north, along the Via Maris, which is the Roman term for uh, Highway 6, you'll find uh, a number of Bedouins there with blue eyes, red hair, and they come from the Crusaders and from Greeks and Romans and a variety of other invaders. In fact, the Bedouins of the Sinai are not a homogeneous group of people, racially speaking. If you go down to Saudi Arabia, they're fairly homogeneous. You can identify people from what tribe they come from just by looking at them. You know he comes from uh, one portion of the Saudi Arabia or another portion of Saudi Arabia. The same thing in Jordan, same thing in Iraq, in Lebanon, but not in the Sinai. They are a mixture of many different races. Nevertheless, they consider themselves to be Arabs, pure Arabs. Now the distribution in Sinai, there's about 70% of the population of the Sinai is Bedouin or derives from Bedouins. We don't know exactly how many there are for many different figures. The reason for that is the Bedouins don't like to tell you how many people they have because historically people have used population figures for taxes. But roughly about 70, 75% of the population of the Sinai is Bedouin. And they are divided into two groups. South of the Atiyah uh, Escarpment, you have the Tuara Bedouin, which are named after Ator. And above that, you have the Altia Bedouin, which go all the way from here up to the coast and into the Negev Desert. <coughs> now, I say groups. The Bedouin's loyalty is to his individual tribe, not to Egypt, not to the Tuara, not to the Tiea. But there are two basic groups, and you'll find as you travel through the Sinai, that the, uh, the way they live is rather different. The Tuara Bedouins, the southern Bedouins, are much poorer than Tiea. And one of the reasons is there's much more water up here than there is in the south. People down here oftentimes use uh, buildings. The uh, Jebeliah Bedouins, for example, use actual houses. They've been using houses for thousands of years. Uh, they use a lot of tents. That comes from Saudi Arabia, Jordan. Up in the north, you're going to find a lot of, uh, particularly way up in the north, a lot of crawls, chicken wire with uh, palm fronds stuck in it. Now I produced uh, a pamphlet on the Sinai Bedouins which looks at each tribe in the Sinai. There are over 40 different tribes scattered between these two nations of uh, Bedouins. And it's too much to go into here in this lecture. Uh, what I'm basically trying to do over the next year is take a picture of a representative of each tribe, a woman and a man, and come up with a description of each tribe as well. But I have about four pages right now. And uh, I'm going to give a copy of this to your training officer. And if anyone you're interested in it, if you're flying in a particular part of the Sinai, you may want to know what Bedouins live there. Military implications. I read in a report recently, an American report, that throughout history, and this is almost a quote, the Bedouins have never taken sides in conflicts, the Bedouins of the Sinai, and that they're the most peace-loving people in the Middle East. Now, frankly, that's just not true. 
The Bedouins have frequently been used as spies for both sides in any numbers of conflicts. They fought in many wars. Uh, for example, in ancient times, they often fought the Pharaonic Egyptians. And rather effectively, the pharaohs, when they were doing their mining, had a long supply line. They would land their uh, boats at Abu Zanima frequently and have 40 mile, imagine that, 40 mile caravans of donkeys to the various mines. It's a very long supply line. And so they paid tribute to the local Bedouins rather than fight them. In, um, in 1799, during the Napoleonic campaign, a Bedouin army, an actual army, made up of uh, elements of the Tuara from the south and the Tiea from the north, invaded and conquered parts of the Negev Desert. That goes all the way to Beersheba. So going in quite a ways into present-day Israel, they conquered it with actual armies. These are the so-called peaceful Bedouins of the Sinai. Now, this led to a series of internecine conflicts for over a century. Uh, the most famous of the conflicts was the War of 1813-1816, known as the War of Abu Sirhan and the Wars of the Zari, fought between 1875 and 1887. In more modern times, after the, uh, the Turks failed to take the Suez Canal in 1916, uh, the, the Turkish government formed a Bedouin army, which fought the British and captured Abu Zanima, attacked Ator, and then was defeated by the Gurkhas. So again, we find that the Bedouins have been used as actual armies. Now, it's true they're not wearing uniforms, they're not regular armies like uh, the Canadian Army, the American Army, but they are armies. They have generals. They have plans of action. And they have successes. Today, every Bedouin male, once he reaches age 18, is subject to Egyptian military service. And you'll find Sinai Bedouins in every branch of the Egyptian army. So they're being trained in modern warfare. Now, a lot of people think the Bedouins are unarmed. They, they walk about the desert and they see the people on their donkeys and their camels. They don't see a sword. They don't see a rifle. So they figure there's no weapons there. Never think the Bedouins are unarmed. They are masters at hiding weapons. They're masters at smuggling. Under a lot of those tents, you'll find vast arsenals of rifles dating back to World War I. They go out to the battlefields. They find rifles, they find ammunition, they find mines, they take uh, the powder out of the mines, and they place it under their tents and either sell it, smuggle it across the border, or use it themselves. They're not helpless, and they know how to fight. Which brings us to adaptation to the desert. How do they fight the desert? Well, in fact, they don't fight it, they live with it. The Bedouins don't wander aimlessly. You know, you look out there in your, in your helicopter as you're flying, particularly us, the pilots and the, and the observers, and you see these folks traveling from nowhere to nowhere, and you think, well, you know, what can they be doing? They know where the water is, and they know how to navigate in the desert without a compass, by looking at the stars. They understand where the relative positions are of various mountains better than we do. And they also realize that in that kind of environment, you don't drink water, which may surprise a lot of you. Now, we drink water because you know, we live here on base, and we have cars, and we, uh, we have bottles of water, and you should drink water, but not for the Bedouin. What he does is he gives the water to his animals, he gives the water to his goats, his uh, camels, and the camels and the goats, they process the water into milk, which is more nutritious than water. So the camels live and the goats live and you get meat and you get uh, hair from those animals. And the Bedouin lives because he has the nutrition of the milk. Very scientific approach to life in the desert. He really understands it. The camel, in fact, represents an excellent example of the Bedouin's wisdom. The animal is stronger, faster than a horse, requires a minimum of supervision or subsistence. A camel can go without water for 25 days in the winter and five days in the hottest heat of the summer. Its dung is used for fuel much like the Indians of Canada and the United States use buffalo chips. Same, same idea, it works very effectively. Its skin is used for mending and making strong weather resistant tents. Now desert life is changing for the Bedouins. You're going to see uh, television antennas sticking out of tents and you're going to find a lot more Bedouins now in Sinai than in, particularly in the north they did in the past. The Egyptians 
are allowing veterans to settle along all of the invasion routes. I've talked to people who are here during the days of the Sinai Field Mission, and the populations are dramatically increasing along the Via Maris, along each of the passes, along the south, and all along this area here particularly. A human buffer zone against an invasion. That's at least one theory for why they're doing it. This area here had a lot of Bedouins living in it until the Israeli occupation. They were kicked out to make way for the settlements and for this airbase, as a matter of fact, which was quite a bit larger than it is right now. And they moved back, along with a lot of the Arabs from the Nile Delta region. But despite the fact that life is changing, they're going to schools now, learning English at an early age. I talked to a Bedouin girl the other day. She was eight years old, had a vocabulary of over 200 words. She could carry on a real conversation with me, just a little tyke like that. Despite that, despite the television sets, despite the radios, despite the occasional trucks, the cars, the Bedouins who wear suits from time to time, these people are very much the same people that they were a thousand years ago. And I'm talking about the basic ethical point of view on life, who they are as a people. That hasn't changed any more than the Apaches are any different now than they were a thousand years ago either. They have houses, they have cars, but they still have a sense of who they are. And that's very much true for the Sinai Bedouin. Work ethic. Um, you know, at first glance, you go out there in the desert and you see women doing all the work, or it appears they're doing all the work, and you get the idea that the males are very, very lazy. And it really isn't true, uh, but I know their actions tend to lead a Western male to that conclusion. The answer is religion. Now, if you go to the Quran, you're going to find an adaptation of the Genesis story from the Bible. And if you recall the Genesis story, what happened? Eve led Adam into sin. And what was the punishment for sin? It was farming. It was living off the soil. So dirt, and anything that has to do with dirt, becomes sinful. Now this is why if you're in a, uh, a Bedouin house or you're in an Arab house, for example, since the Bedouins did spread Islam to the Arab world, you don't cross your legs because you're showing the soles of your feet to the Arab and to the Bedouin. That's considered a gross insult to show the soles of your feet to a Bedouin because it's dirt. Again, the Genesis story. Woman brought man into sin, and rightly or wrongly. Woman brought man into sin according to the Genesis and according to the Quran, and therefore woman is a lower state of life than man, so she does the farming. Now maybe this is just a rationalization, and maybe they are really lazy. We can say that, but don't say it to them. They really believe they're not lazy. They really believe that that is the way to live, that God punished the women and punished man for their sin and made dirt the punishment. The Bedouins are very clean people. You go into a Bedouin tent, you gotta take your shoes off just the same way you do in Japan. When you finish eating your food and before you eat your food, you wash your hands. The implements are very clean, they're not greasy. The floor is swept clean, even inside a Bedouin crawl. They're a very clean people, surprisingly. And uh, they consider themselves an aristocrat. Again, they feel that they are God's chosen people. They are the true Arab, and they are the highest form of life. But sometimes uh, these views get them to a bit of trouble. The Bedouins believe in their, in their ethics with a sort of fervor of a religious fanatic. And one of those things we're gonna talk about later on in the lecture is hospitality. The Bedouins really believe in it. You go into a Bedouin house, even as a stranger, and you have a right to the last cup of coffee, the last glass of water. They really believe that. Uh, the modern tea uh, we drink in the MDF came from the British here in the Sinai. And of course, with that tea, you have sugar. Well, here we, I found a clash between two ethical values. Now, on the one hand, they don't believe in dirt, so they do very little farming, subsistence farming, except for the north, and the values are changing somewhat up there. Bedouins are farming a lot more than they used to. And then you have this other value, which is that you're supposed to give all your tea, the best tea, to the guests. In the 1930s, El Qasima, which is the oldest, longest standing Bedouin settlement in the Sinai, went bankrupt because of this clash of values. You see, because they believe that dirt is evil and farming is bad, and should only be done in the minimum, 
They only grew enough crops to feed themselves, not enough crops to sell to market. Yet at the same time, they had to give tea to their guests and put sugar in the tea. So they mortgaged their land to the tea merchants and sugar merchants of El Arish. And in the 1930s, as I say, they went bankrupt and El Arish owned El Casima, strictly because of a clash of ethics. Again, they believe in these things the same way a religious fanatic believes in whatever he happens to be that he believes in. They believe in it absolutely. Now, fortunately, the, the uh, British governor at the time did something about this, and the Bedouins of El Qasima got their land back. But it's an illustration of where these people are coming from. They look at the women from El, from El Gore who drive out of, on a bicycle off base in shorts, and they see an evil person. You're really insulting them when you do that. Uh, it's a very different culture, and you should think about that and think about where they're coming from. They're not going to change. They're going to be here thousands, millions of years after you leave. Slavery. Again, to save himself from tilling the soil, from farming, Bedouins used to use black slaves from the Sudan and other parts of Africa. And the practice is illegal now, and I understand that there aren't any more slaves, or there are a few rumors. Basically, it stopped in the 1950s with uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. He put a stop to that pretty much, pretty effectively. Uh, there is a camp uh, just about six kilometers to the southeast of El Gora of black Bedouins. These are the descendants of slaves. And my understanding is I'll talk to you about that. There are people there who actually were slaves at one time and are now free. Uh, they're considered equal, however, socially to anybody else. I mean, uh, a regular Bedouin won't marry a black Bedouin, but there's no prejudice when it comes to jobs. They can go into the same restaurant, sit at the same table, that sort of thing. Except for intermarriage, they're considered equal. And always have been, even in the days of slavery, which is perhaps a bit surprising uh, to an American considering our own background. Now, aesthetics. When I first came here, a lot of people said to me, well, you know, the Bedouins, they don't have no aesthetic value. You just look at those crawls. What kind of aesthetic value could they have? The Bedouins have a deep sense of poetry. The highest state of life for a Bedouin is to be a poet, not a warrior. That's number two. The highest is to be a poet. They love art in any form. Underneath all those black gowns and, and burqas, the, the face cloth in front of the Bedouin's woman, there's a lot of makeup. There's jewelry to entice the husband. There's fancy undergarments to entice the husband, which she makes, which are very artistic. And in fact, uh, I have a few examples of beadwork. A, uh, a woman's state or level in, in the uh, tribe is judged by the level of her beadwork. And so if she doesn't do it, if she just has something like this, she wears around all the time on her chest, she's a lower level person socially than someone who has something like this. I'm going to pass a few of these out. Fine, as you, as you wander through the Sinai, that there are many different kinds of beadwork. Down by St. Catharines, you're going to find a lot of beadwork down there, which is identical to patterns used in Romania. And again, that comes to the fact that many people came from Romania. But you'll find many different kinds of patterns, are very beautiful, very intricate, uh, very sophisticated. They're also interested in music. This instrument here is a rababa. From this instrument came the Arab guitar and violin, and from that came the Western guitar, the Spanish guitar. From this instrument, you can see the resemblance to this in a violin. It's a, a box with a goat skin wrapped around it, some holes to uh, let air out and uh, for, for sound purposes. It's tied together with a goat hide, and it has a single strand, which you, you hold like that, and you just move the bow, very much like you do a violin. This is uh, only about uh, two or three years old, but this particular model of Rababa is over 4,000 years old. It's been used consistently through the Sinai. It's coming very hard to find now. But again, as I say, your guitar, the Spanish guitar, the thing we use uh, now in rock and roll, the electric guitar derives from that, derives from this simple instrument, which comes from the Bedouin. Bedouins of uh, the Middle East, not just the Sinai.
pass news to get to know each other, they have music, they have poetry. You're going to find, if you ever go to a coffee tea ceremony in a Bedouin tent, they're going to play this. Or they're going to play this, a flute. They love to, li to listen to flute music. Shepherdesses, uh, you know, in Greece, if you remember your Greek mythology, always played the flute. Same way with uh, Bedouin shepherdesses. It's uh, music and poetry are an integral part of Bedouin life. I mentioned to you early on in the lecture that the Bedouins have fought a number of wars and at one point tried to uh, conquer, or in fact did conquer, portions of the Negev Desert. And this led to a series of international conflicts over a period of about 100 years. Late in that period, during the wars of the Zari, the Bedouins that were then living in the Negev, descendant from those who had conquered the Negev, found out that more Bedouins were going to be coming from uh, this portion of the Sinai. And the attack is going to take place right about here. And they didn't want to have a war. So they made up some poetry, a long poem, a diplomatic poem, if you will, and sent it off by messenger to the people who were going to attack them and said, we think you're wonderful people. And we're wonderful people, too. There's really no reason for, to fight. We can get along. We can trade. But if you do fight us, we will fight back. This is all done through poetry. Uh, fine sense of diplomacy, even amongst these so-called uneducated, coarse individuals. Well, people from the South responded with another poem. I have copies of them here, but they're very long. But it's a parody, a very close parody of the first poem. And they almost line by line, it insults the other tribe. Well, after they, they've gone through an exchange of poems, then they decided it was time to fight, and they fought a war, and the people in the uh, Negev won. But the interesting thing to me is that before they shed any blood, they go to poetry and diplomacy, and then they fight. Now, speaking of poetry, their poetry can be quite beautiful. Uh, they, they love love poems, poems about sex particularly. Uh, the Bedouins can be extremely graphic. You know, when we talk about sex uh, in a mixed, in mixed company, uh, we kind of tone the language down. We use euphemisms to describe the sex act and things of this nature. Uh, not so the Bedouins. They go into every bit of detail, and the women love it. Uh, amongst themselves, however, only. Only amongst themselves. But I have an example here of some of the uh, less graphic poetry. Just to kind of give you an example of the sort of thing they write, and this is about uh, 50 years old, but it's very typical of poetry. It's been around the Sinai for a long time. And a man is describing a woman that he wants to marry, and he says, your breast is like the marble of a bathhouse and like a falcon in the right hand. Your two breasts are like pomegranates that decorate the gardens. Your arms are silver. Your belly is soft, like uh, soft pastry. That may not be the finest poetry from a Western standpoint, but again, the point is that they have a sense of poetry and its importance in life. You know, the, the Bedouins, they don't get uh, ulcers. Very seldom. They live a long life, back in the, in the 50s and 60s. And a part of that reason is they take life slow. They, uh, they listen to music all the time. The women are making uh, beadwork. And they, they really understand that workaholics don't last very long. Now, that takes us to religion. Adherence to uh, Islamic doctrine varies in the Sinai. Most Bedouins are Muslims. A few are Christians. There are a couple of tribes, particularly the Al Saleb tribe, and there are some Shia, although very few Shia. Most of the Bedouins in the Sinai are Sunni, of the Hanbali or Maliki schools. An interesting thing I found out about the Bedouins of the Sinai. If you go to Saudi Arabia, the Bedouins over there, from whence Islam spread, are very devout Muslims, extremely devout. You come to the Sinai, and these people are animist Muslims. An animist is someone who believes that uh, trees and the ocean and streams and mountains have spirits. You've heard of the word genie? Genie comes from the Arabic word jean, which means spirit. And they believe this, the Bedouins. You'll find, particularly in the north, uh, in the El Arish area, Bedouins and El Arish believe that the palm trees have spirits. And you frequently find them asking the spirits of the palm trees, those groves that you, uh, that you pass when you're just entering into El Arish, they're all owned by Bedouins, they will pray to the spirits of those individual palm trees to intercede with Allah. They will pray to the Mediterranean Ocean to intercede with Allah. Now, that's not good Islam. That's a heresy. But that, 
is something which is very indicative of a primitive culture. You're going to find this in Africa. You're going to find it in Asia. Animism. You find it in Japan, for example. Uh, these people think, however, they are good Muslims despite all that. Now, this concept, <coughs> excuse me, this concept of intercession. They don't have any uh, any mosques in the Sinai. They do have a couple of uh, religious structures you should know about. One is a, a round white building, a dome with a crescent on it. Now you'll find a couple of these uh, right around where we live. You find one of them at uh, One Bravo, which is right uh, before you cross over into the, uh, the B zone. And if you're flying the, uh, along Wadi Quran, come out to Wadi El Sheikh. A lot of you know about the task force down there. Just south of the task force is another one of these buildings. And what it is, it's the place where a Sheikh was buried. A Sheikh is a leader of a tribe. He can either be the head of the tribe, or he can be simply a religious leader, someone very good and holy. And when he dies, they put one of these domes over the spot where he died. And then once a year, in a ceremony called Zuara, all of the people from the, from the tribe come to this spot, and they ask the Sheikh to intercede with Allah on their behalf. Inside this dome here, on shelves, you're going to find uh, implements for making coffee and tea. During the Israeli occupation, a number of Israeli soldiers went into one of these. I think it was the one near One Bravo and they took everything out. A couple hours later, the jeep overturned and everybody was dead. The Sinai Bedouin believe that stealing from one of these, in fact, the Muslims all around the Islamic world believe stealing from a mosque is one of the greatest of sins. You think about that, that's pretty much the way we think. Someone goes into a church and steals the gold out of the church, that's a serious sin. Well, these people believe if you do that, God will kill you. Now, if you find one of these, uh, these buildings here, feel free to approach it, but don't take any photographs without permission. Don't walk inside without permission. Even if there's nobody around, there's usually somebody looking at you from the distance. Ask permission first, and you can get it. You can even get permission to photograph them, but ask first. Now, they have another structure, which I want to mention before I get into Zawara, which you'll see a lot in the Sinai. This is the closest thing they have to a mosque, except in the cities. And out in the middle of nowhere, they can't always build one of these things, there aren't enough stones around. So they build a circle of stones with an entranceway pointed to Mecca. And that serves the same function as a mosque. People will go inside of this, they'll lie down and kneel and pray to God. If you see them in there, don't photograph them, don't interrupt them, don't bother them. And when you come to either one of these structures, if you do go inside, take your shoes off. Again, cleanliness. The Bedouins are an extremely clean people. You don't bring dirt into a holy place. You don't bring dirt into a home. You always clean yourself. You frequently will see Bedouins washing their feet before they go into one of these things. Now, I mentioned Zuara. Zawara is rather an interesting ceremony. Uh, as I say, once a year, the Bedouins from the tribe get together and they, uh, they exchange news. Now, when you think of the Bedouins, you think of people who are very sort of male-oriented. The women do all the cooking. That's the thought. The, women are the, the men are the warriors, they're the poets, the women are the, uh, the cooks. But in Zawara, the men uh, kill the sheep, the men do all the cooking. And then, they give the food, the meat, to the men and to the poor of the, of the tribe. One of the purposes of Zuara is to share with the poor. One of the five pillars of Islam is to give, it's called the zakat, is to give to the poor. If you don't give to the poor, you are not a Muslim. And that is a Bedouin custom given to Muhammad. They strongly believe in that. People uh, maintain these structures, either one of them. And during Suara, the Bedouins give money to the, uh, the people who maintain the structures. And those people keep some of the money, but to give the bulk of the money, again, to the poor. Uh, during Suara, usually on the last night, they have a dance called Dahiyah. Now, you've all heard of the belly dance. 
a very uh, sexual dance. It's, uh, you see a lot of it in Lebanon, you see a lot of it in Turkey. I don't know if it's true or not, but some experts on dance believe that the belly dance derives from the dahiya. And uh, I'm trying to make arrangements to have uh, the dahiya shown on base, but uh, I'll show you what it's all about. Here is a typical Bedouin house, Bedouin tent. They're usually built the same way. On one side, you're going to have uh, the women's area, which you don't enter ever, and the other side, the guest area. Now, during Dahia, you have a fire in front of the woman's area, and then you have a line of men behind the fire. Inside the woman's area, a woman is, is singing. You also find uh, a number of men who probably over here, it doesn't really matter, and they're singing as well. And then at some point, uh, the men start dancing back and forth. I don't know the step very well, but they basically go back like this and back like that, keep going back and forth, singing. And then a woman comes out, and she's dancing with a sword. It's a sword dance. And she talks about sex very, very graphically. It is one of the most sexually graphic things that the Bedouins do. You think of it as a very conservative people, and they are, but they, there are times when they shed that conservatism in our point of view. They don't consider shedding it. And they talk about sex very, very graphically. Uh, I have an example here of... Uh, that's Dahia. That's what you'd hear. They're, they sing and they clap. And while they're doing that, this woman is dancing here, back and forth. As she goes forward, imitating the sexual movement, the men move back. They go back and forth, back and forth, as though they're making love to each other. But they are not allowed to touch the woman. The woman can be married, she can be single. The point is, she's fertile and can have children. Now, the dahiya is used in a lot of uh, ceremonies, not just zuar. You'll find a dahiya used in weddings. You'll find it any number of ceremonies. I was talking to some Bedouins the other day, had dinner with them in their tent up in the north, not too far from here. And they were telling me that it used to be that every time they had a major crop, a successful crop, they would uh, celebrate dahiya. But uh, as I say, I'm going to try to get it uh, shown here on base. It's really an interesting thing to see. It does vary in different parts of the Sinai. Now, justice and honor and blood vengeance. You've all heard about Islamic justice, probably. You know, in Saudi Arabia, the Yemen, Iraq, even Iran, if you are a pickpocket, you lose your hand. If you're a peeping Tom, you lose your eye. And uh, they're, I mean, they're very strict about that thing. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, a hand for stealing, that sort of thing. But not the Sinai Bedouin. The Sinai Bedouin have a system called Orphi Law, or Bedouin Law. Now, they understand that to, to survive in a desert requires teamwork. You have to work together. If you cut a guy's hand off, he's not going to be able to support himself. He's not going to be able to support his family or his children or the tribe. The tribe is a group of people who depend on each other. So they issue a series of fines for pickpocketing. It would be uh, X number of goats, perhaps. For killing somebody, it would be maybe 200 camels or whatever. There's some sort of system of fines, uh, I saw the, uh, this, I think it was 200 camels for, for, was for uh, the loss of a woman and 500 camels for the loss of a man. This was in the 1930s. But they have a series of fines. It's a very humane system. Unlike, I think, uh, the system of justice in the Arabian Peninsula. But there are uh, instances where they will kill for, uh, for punishment. And it's called blood vengeance. Let's say that I went out into, on Highway 6 and I'm driving along real fast, or maybe I'm on my way to Sheikh Suwait, and I pass some Bedouins and I knock one of them in, with the car and kill him. Now, right away, what I have done is I have not only killed somebody, but I've committed a crime against a tribe. I represent a tribe, the MFO. It's not a crime by me as an individual, it's a crime by the entire tribe. And that tribe feels uh, that it is quite just that they kill anyone in our tribe. Anyone, not just me, anybody else, one of you. That's desert law. 
a life for a life. Now, as I say, they do have Orphe law, which means that, uh, I mean, this happened recently when some Bedouins were killed, you can sort of buy them off, if you will. It's uh, in American dollars, I think it's about $2,000 a life, something along those lines. But some years ago, during the Sinai Field Mission days, uh, some uh, observers were shot at by Bedouins, and some people speculate it was because somebody had hurt a Bedouin very seriously about six months before. And my point there is, is that if you hurt a Bedouin one day, he may hurt you a year later. He'll wait his time. And I take that very, very seriously, but vengeance. Courage. The Bedouins, no matter where they are in the Middle East, consider themselves to be a very courageous people. Courage is defined as the ability to withstand pain or emotional strain without showing it. Uh, corporal punishment. If you've ever been in a parochial school, you remember that uh, they take a stick to your rear end, and the idea is that it makes you more of a man later on. Same way with the Bedouins. They beat their children, the men, a little bit, the male children, to make them men later on. They don't consider it to be cruel. And so you shouldn't comment on it. If you see a, a parent slapping a child around, that's their way of life. They believe, all of them, that it is the proper way to raise children. Now this uh, sense of courage and not showing, uh, not showing pain can be taken to real extremes. If you go into the southern part of the Sinai where there's a strong influence in this area here from Saudi Arabia, um, they have a little ceremony down there sometimes. Circumcision usually takes place uh, between the ages of uh, well, when you're born until you're five years old. But sometimes in the South, they wait until you get married. And on your wedding night, the man and the woman who are about to be married stand across from each other, and the man is circumcised right in front of his bride-to-be. If he shows any pain, if he cries and screams, then he loses the woman, because he's not a brave man. Secret is not to be born in that tribe. Now, I mentioned tribe. The Bedouins' total loyalty is to the tribe. The tribe is family. And in fact, that's literally quite correct. A tribe is an extended family of cousins, second, first, third, fourth, tenth uh, level cousins, all intermarried. It's a family. And that's why they take it so strongly. When you attack one member of the family, you are, in fact, attacking the entire family. You're attacking a cousin. We probably feel the same way. If I uh, killed your brother, you'd try to come after me. Well, they feel the same way. Now, each tribe has a certain level in society. And the Bedouins uh, have a concept called a Shia, which means you don't marry down. You only marry up or laterally. And it's very difficult to marry up since you can't marry down. And this can cause serious, serious problems. About, as I understand, about a year ago, perhaps a little less than a year ago, uh, a Westerner in El Arish was dating a Bedouin woman. Now, that's extremely difficult to do. I don't recommend it. But he had found a Bedouin woman. They had a relationship. They had sex. And it was agreed between the two of them that the Bedouin woman would go with the man back to, I think it was the United States. Several days later, that woman was found dead in front of his house, a Shia. See, they consider themselves at a higher state of life than we are. You are taking that woman's life in her hands if you try to mess around with her. My advice is don't do it. This isn't Jordan. In Jordan, the Bedouins over there are much more Western. I dated a Bedouin girl in Jordan, but she had a master's degree in art. She had been in Paris, London, Washington, spoke several languages. It's not that way in the Sinai Peninsula. Which brings us to sex. It isn't impossible to date a Bedouin woman in the Sinai, but it's extremely, extremely difficult. They have a series of customs you have to go through. And the point is that most Bedouins are quite illiterate. Now, that's changing since the occupation. The Egyptians have done a lot to try to, to educate the Bedouins. They've set up schools, as I say, all along the various invasion routes. I met a girl the other day who speaks English fairly well, and she's only about that tall. But most of them are illiterate, particularly older Bedouins. And there's a tremendous cultural gap uh, between us. Uh, in fact, uh, dating is forbidden by the Quran, although it does go on, has through the ages. How can you stop men and women from dating each other? But it is forbidden in the Quran. 
Usually what happens is, is that a Bedouin male will see a woman, usually about age 13 or 14, uh, by a water well, and he'll look at her and she looks at him and he'll tie a little uh, something on a twig and she'll respond about a week later with something and then they get together out in a, in a wadi. Now, if they're caught in the wadi in the daytime, he is considered immediately guilty of adultery. If she is caught at nighttime, she's considered guilty because she was away from her tent. Now, the way it works is if uh, you're accused by the woman of assaulting the woman in the daytime, you're guilty and there's only one way you can get away from being punished. And that's a ceremony called Bisha. Now, if you remember the Salem witch trials in the United States, uh, we had something called trial by ordeal. You take a woman, you dump her down in the water, and if she survived, she was innocent. Now, how do you survive being drowned? Well, Bisha is somewhat similar to that. It takes place outside of Ishmaelia. And what they do is, if you say you're innocent and you're not guilty, you, you insist that you're innocent, you go to this little uh, field outside of Ishmaelia, and they have uh, Bisha judges there, and they, they heat up a branding iron or a teapot until it is green. I mean, just really, really hot. Pass it around to the different judges. You get to swallow glass water about that size, swirl it around your mouth, and then you have to lick the branding iron three times. Now, if you survive that, your tongue survives it, then you're considered to be innocent. I talked to a man about two weeks ago who had gone through Bisha six times, which may say something about his sense of discretion. But a uh, man's 80 years old. Now, Bisha is used for a lot of different things, and not just for uh, sexual indiscretions. Uh, if you steal and someone says, someone says I stole from, from someone else and I say I didn't, uh, you might go through Bisha. You can insist on it. Uh, once you, uh, you request Bisha, if you, um, if you then refuse, you're considered guilty and you're ostracized, shunned by the tribe, and sent out into the desert to die. There's a lot of divorce in the Sinai, surprisingly enough, uh, about 17%, perhaps 25% of all the Bedouins are actually divorced, which is, I found, a surprisingly large figure. This, this is an Israeli figure, and I always kind of wonder about the Israeli figures, because I don't think the Bedouins, uh, while they flourished rather well under Israeli occupations, really liked them very much and gave them uh, very accurate figures. But in fact, there is divorce. They know it exists. A woman can divorce a man under Islamic law. Uh, for example, if a man refuses to have sex with a woman he's married to, she can divorce him. If he has sex with another woman and there are three witnesses, she has the right to divorce immediately. There's no trial, just bang, there's a divorce. When you marry a woman, ordinarily you give money to the woman's family. It's about $2,000 uh, this year. And the woman's family then buys some gold for the woman and they furbish a room in the house, uh, usually the uh, woman's area, with uh, various uh, carpets and brass and that sort of thing. Now, if you sell some of that jewelry without the woman's permission, if you sell anything that she owns without a permission, she can divorce you. Other than that, it's very difficult to divorce a man. A man, however, can divorce a woman rather easily. When it comes to marriage, uh, women have no say at all in marriage. Uh, unless it's informal. Cousins have first right to marriage. Let's say that I wanted to marry uh, this girl over here uh, in the sweater, and we decided we want to get married, and the parents went along with it, and then her first cousin walks up and says, I want to marry her. I have to step aside. He has an absolute right over me. I can't say a word about it. If I do complain about it and make a big thing about it, he can fight me for that woman, and I can actually be shunned from the tribe. Uh, a lot of people ask me if uh, Bedouin women have any legal rights. Uh, they have a lot of legal rights under Egyptian law, particularly uh, under Sadat and Mubarak. Uh, President Mubarak has a system where there are some informal, not elected, but appointed people who represent the Bedouins and people of the Sinai in a consul in Cairo. And in fact, there's a woman in El Arish, not a Bedouin woman, but a woman in, in any event, who represents the uh, women of the northern Sinai. Uh, basically, she represents the women be the line for it, but all the women along would be embarrassed, and as I understand, the women in this area right here. If they have any problem at all, 
They go to this woman in El Arish, and then she takes it directly to President Mubarak. They meet once a month. And my understanding is, is that the Egyptian government listens, and they have made some changes in law relative to women's rights based upon the complaints made by Bedouin women. Generosity. Now, you've all heard about Bedouin generosity, and I think it's probably all true what you've heard. Bedouins are extremely generous. I mentioned zakat. Zakat is one of the five pillars of Islam, the sense of giving to the poor. If you don't give to the poor, you are considered a very bad Muslim. You're going to go to hell. You have to give to the poor. And it's roughly 25 to 3% of your annual income, a tithing, if you will. Uh, during Ramadan, people are supposed to give extra to the poor. So if it's in the month of Ramadan and you're walking in El Arish or you're in Cairo on leave, something of this nature, and you see a poor person, you're going to see a lot of them during Ramadan on the street begging, it's expected that you give them something. You don't give them $20, just give them uh, maybe a buck or half a dollar or something like that, but give them something. It's considered a sin not to give them at least a little something. And of course, generosity goes right into hospitality. The Bedouins really believe in hospitality. This is integral to their being. And it's part of the fact they live in a desert. Again, it's teamwork. They don't have newspapers out here, and they only recently have they had radio. So the only way they can exchange news is that Bedouins meet each other. And so they set up a system of how they can meet. Now, you remember the, the, the diagram I drew here of the house? Maybe this could be a Bedouin tent as well, designed much the same way. Let's say that you're a Bedouin or you're a Canadian or whatever, and you want to visit some some Bedouins living in this area. This is the front where the opening is, and that's the rear. Never approach from the rear. On the woman's side, in this corner, is where the women go to the bathroom. That's where they go to the toilet. It's a gross insult, of course, to watch a woman going to the toilet or anybody. Uh, but I mean, you can get killed doing that. So always approach from the front. And at a healthy distance, say, uh, the distance between me and the fellow at the end of the room, call their attention to yourself. Okay, if there's a man who's in the house or the uh, tent, he'll come out and see you. If there's no man, a woman will come out and invite you in. Now, if you need water, they'll give you water. If you're out in the, in the desert and your car is turned over and you don't have any water and there's a Bedouin tent just you know a few hundred yards away, not even that far, you shouldn't go too far from your vehicle. But if you really need water, there's a better intent there. You can ask them for water. They will give you water. Just ask for Maya. Anyway, normally, ordinarily, what they'll do is, unless it's an emergency, if you just want to get to know them, pass on news, they will invite you into the guest area. Let's make a bigger diagram of this. Imagine that this blackboard is the guest area, the lower half of the tent, and above it, there's another blackboard, which is the female area. You'll come in to the top. The host will be here. There'll be a fire in front of the host ordinarily. And you will sit on his right side. There will also be people over here and people here. You're always facing the host. Always face the host. Never look to the female side. There'll be a partition there of carpets or whatever. Okay, then as you're coming in, in fact, probably before you got there, if they saw you coming, uh, the host here will have roasted some coffee beans on the fire. And once they're dry, he'll pound them in a mortar and pestle. The sound of the pounding of the mortar and pestle is, is a form of music, and he does it very loudly so people in other tents can hear him, and they'll start pouring in. Again, you're going to sit over here, and then the other bed will come around and we'll sit here. And then they uh, will make the coffee by pouring the, uh, the ground, now very finely ground, coffee beans and cardamom into uh, coffee pots. They'll let it boil three times. And then they'll serve you this bitter coffee, which represents the bitterness of the desert. They'll serve you three cups, and if they're very traditional Bedouins, three cups of tea. While this is going on, um, they'll be playing the rababa, that violin instrument, or they may be playing a flute, and they'll certainly be singing, and they'll certainly be reciting poetry if they are traditional Bedouins. Once all that's finished, after you've gone through the ceremony of them honoring you, 
Then you pass on your news. Then you ask for help. Obviously, if it's an emergency, you can ask for help right away. But the ordinary way is you first go through this whole ceremony, and then you ask for help. Or you pass on news, or you just want to say hello, you say hello. Now, if you really want to see this thing, the, the coffee tea ceremony in action, go to uh, outside of Beersheba in the Lahav Forest. There's a Bedouin museum there, which is probably the world's best Bedouin museum. And they have a coffee tent. And you can go through a portion of this coffee tea ceremony right there with a genuine Bedouin. Now, as I say, this concept of hospitality, giving you the best tea, the best coffee, uh, got El Qasima into bankruptcy. But they really believe in this sort of thing. They believe in all these things I've been talking about with a fervor of a religious fanatic. It's part of being a Bedouin. If a Bedouin doesn't treat you well, if he doesn't give you good hospitality, his stature in the tribe goes down. And remember how important a tribe is to a Bedouin. It's absolutely imperative that he treats you very, very well. Now that brings us to clothing. I mentioned to you that a woman's stature in the tribe is based upon the beauty of her clothing. A lot of people ask me, well, why do they wear this black gown over their, uh, over their body? It's not very good looking. And besides, in a desert, it raises the body temperature 10, maybe 20 degrees. Basic reason is, if you look at the desert, you know, its color is not really so very different than the color on this map. And you can see the black against that yellowish color. That's why they wear the black. So you can see a woman 20 miles away. During the days of the Sinai Field Mission, we had people dressed in uh, observer orange. And my understanding is the incidence of fluorescent color amongst women has risen since uh, SFM and the MFO came into existence. Uh, I haven't documented that. I've just heard this from various people who have been here over the years. But I've been told by Bedouins that the reason they, the women will wear fluorescent clothing when they wear it, again, is so you can see them a long way off. Just the way, that's the reason we wear the orange, as a matter of fact. It used to be 20, 30 years ago, even before then, if you looked at a Bedouin's burqa, the uh, piece of cloth that covers the face, if you looked at the chest plate, those uh, two pieces of beadwork I passed out, you could tell what tribe a woman was from. You could also tell what her marital status was, her sexual status. You really can't do that anymore. But uh, just to give you sort of a hint as to what it used to be like, a blue scarf and trim on the dress meant a barren woman. And even now, sometimes you'll see a very old woman wearing blue, and that will mean frequently that she's barren. A lot of red, a lot of decorations meant that she was ready uh, for marriage. She had just passed into puberty, perhaps. Uh, by the way, at that time, young boys are given daggers to prove that they are men. If she wears a lot of green, it ordinarily meant that there was a death in the family. Um, now, I guess I say this has all changed over the last 20, 30 years. You'll find married women wearing blue, green, any kind of color you like. It doesn't really mean very much anymore. But if you do see a woman wearing the beadwork, that I showed you out there. You can identify the tribe from that beadwork. That still does exist. And something I'm hoping to do while I'm out here is get examples of beadwork from each of the various tribes. Um, in my pamphlet, I have described a number of different hairstyles, uh, tattoos, and things of this nature which can ad identify a woman as being with a particular tribe. Uh, if you've been in Asia, you know that sometimes they use tattoos to identify a, a tribe, and they do the same thing in the Sinai. Clothing for men tends to be uh, a lot more common than it does for, for women. They just wear the gafia, which is the kerchief. Usually it's white in color, and perhaps black and white. They wear the, um, the abba, which is the, the gown, nals, which are the sandals. Usually in the Sinai, they will wear a silver ring with a green stone in it, and that green stone uh, comes from this area of the Sinai. That's very common amongst Bedouin men. It's uh, not necessarily turquoise, it's simply a green stone. In the Wadi Faran area, um, in St. In Catharines, this area around here, and all the way along the coast, you'll find that very often Bedouin people who are from that area, Bedouin men, don't wear the kafia, the headdress. Instead, they wear a turban wrapped. If you see that, you know they generally come from the south rather than from the north. 
Now, we have some basic do's and don'ts for the Bedouins. I've covered a lot of them so far. Uh, you come up to a religious place such as the mosque, you come up to the, uh, the circle out in the desert, they don't photograph it. You ask permission to go in. You can take pictures of it, but only after permission. Take your shoes off before you go in. Remember, the Bedouins are extremely clean, same way into, in a Bedouin home. If you're invited into a Bedouin home, there's no reason why you can't be the very friendly people. Take your shoes off. They'll probably offer you water to wash your feet. Don't have any fear of meeting these people. I met a lot of them, and they're very nice people. Uh, they're our neighbors. They live right outside the gate. Uh, I've talked to uh, the fourth surgeon and, and various senior people in the MFO. They don't mind you meeting a Bedouin so long as you understand where they're coming from and what their rules of behavior are. Uh, don't offer pork or alcohol to them, for example. That's uh, against Islamic uh, law. Fornication, adultery, or serious sins. I talked about the woman in El Arish who was left dead in front of her lover's home. Uh, I've talked about Bisha. They take that sort of thing very seriously. Uh, you could be setting yourself up in the MFO for an incident. Remember, every time you do something against the Bedouins, you are committing a crime by a tribe against a tribe. That's critical to understand. We are a tribe in their eyes. Now, I've been insulting you all day throughout this lecture if you were Bedouins. I use my left hand a lot when I'm uh, showing things, you know, going like this. The left hand is used to clean yourself after going to the toilet by the Bedouins. And again, that's dirt. So you never wave your left hand as you're flashing dirt into a Bedouin's face. That's a rule behavior even with the Arabs. Uh, in fact, you really should avoid all hand gestures unless you absolutely know that it's a safe hand gesture. You know, in the United States, and I don't know if it's the same way in Canada, if you go like this, that means A-OK. -okay. That's the evil eye in the Sinai. You've just insulted a, a Bedouin. This is a, a safe symbol to use. It means everything's all right. But try to avoid Western hand gestures unless you really know it's a safe gesture. When you're sitting, don't show the soles of your feet. Whether you're with a city Egyptian or a Bedouin, it's considered a gross insult, again, because of dirt. They're very clean people. Uh, if you go into a Bedouin home or even an Arab home, don't give gifts unless they give you a gift. And if, if you give a gift, Make sure that it is a gift which uh, is representative of that person's wealth. If he's a very poor person and you give him an expensive radio, he's going to feel obligated to give you something of equal value, even if it puts him into greater poverty. So if a fellow gives you something and he's very, very poor and you want to give him something in return, make sure it's something which is not worth a great deal of money. It's the gesture that counts, not the substance. It's the gesture and the meaning behind the gesture that's important. Uh, if you go into uh, a home and you see something you like, you can say something nice about it, but don't fawn over it. Don't say, wow, this is a wonderful vase, and talk about it over and over again, the way we might in a Western home talk about a painting or talk about uh, anything, uh, woodwork in the house. He will feel obligated to give that to you, and you'll feel insulted if you don't accept it. Now, he knows you're a foreigner and he'll give you latitude, but he really will feel obligated to give it to you. Don't throw candy to the children alongside the road. A lot of people do this. Uh, we have discovered that if you, uh, I mean, they've gotten the habit of accepting candy on the side of the road. If you don't throw candy to them, they tend to throw rocks back at us. Um, and we, the observers who are on the road so much, uh, are sort of sensitive to being stoned. So don't throw any candy to them. If you want to give them a gift, give them a piece of candy, but walk up to them, that sort of thing. Don't throw it to them. When you're meeting a couple on the street for the first time, talk to the male first, not the female. In fact, don't talk to the female at all, even if you're a woman, without permission of the male. Uh, don't photograph Bedouins without permission. Now, they'll give you permission. I've got hundreds of photographs of Bedouins. Photographs of Bedouin women, photographs of Bedouin men. Photographs of better women without the uh, burqa, all of that. But you had to ask permission first. And usually what happens is if you have a bunch of better uh, women out here, one or two women will step aside. They don't want their picture taken. And the rest will say, take our picture. And they'll probably ask for a copy. You'll find that just as with the American Indians, many Bedouins believe that when you take their photograph, you're taking their gene, their spirit away from them. It's captured by the camera. 
Be sensitive to that. Ask permission first before you take a photograph. Again, uh, related to the dirt, take your shoes off in moss, take your shoes off before you go into a home. Bedouins like to shout at each other, and it can be extremely graphic. If you start learning Arabic, you're going to find that their language is extremely sexually graphic. Don't do the same thing. They will feel that you are lowering yourself. Be very polite. They yell and scream at you. It's just their way. Don't yell and scream at them. They may touch you. The Bedouins like to touch each other. They may grab your arm. Don't get angry. Be very patient with them at just the way they are. If you try to push them around, you yell and scream at them, they're going to get angry and intransigent and perhaps dangerous. When offered coffee or tea, accept, unless you really can't. Now, we observers are out there all the time. We're offered uh, tea and coffee uh, at Army bases all over to Sinai. And sometimes we just can't accept it because we have a mission and we've got to get to the next place. And they understand that. The Bedouins will understand a little less. Now, if you can't accept the coffee and tea, make sure you've got a very good excuse. Because remember, hospitality and generosity is not only part of Islam, it's an integral part of being a Bedouin. Again, a Bedouin's stature in his tribe depends on how well he treats other people. And so if you don't give him a chance to treat you well, you haven't given him a chance to show that he's a good Bedouin. And other people are going to see that, you have, that he hasn't treated you well, and they're going to think, oh, well, you know, he's not a very generous man, and his stature will lower. Commenting on a man's son's expected when you go into a home, but don't talk about the daughters, don't talk about the wives, until you get to know the family. Now, I was invited to a Bedouin a home the other day, and I wasn't able to meet the wife, I wasn't able to meet the mother. I knew that was going to happen. But I was allowed to meet the daughters. The daughters were pre-puberty. Now, that you can do. But once they reach puberty, you're not going to be able to meet them. Um, if a Bedouin asks for water in the Sinai, if you're out there in the middle of nowhere, and this guy says, I've got to have some water, give it to him. He has a right to it. It's desert law and it's common sense anyway. If that man should die for lack of water because you didn't give him water, then you've got a blood vengeance situation on, or a potential for blood vengeance. If you come across a Bedouin in the desert who is hurt, he's been in an auto accident or something like that, render assistance. Now, I talked to the fourth surgeon about this some months ago, and the basic procedure is, is that you, in fact, uh, Charlie and I were involved in something like this just the other day, what you do is you go over and uh, you do sort of like a triage. You find out what the situation is and uh, you wash the wounds. Keep it very simple and radio for help. But don't ignore them. Don't just go right by them. If they should die and it's found out they die because you just went right by them callously, again, you have a situation for blood vengeance. They have a right to expect a little humanity. And uh, again, if you don't show it, then they're going to seek retribution against us. Uh, you're going to find that the Bedouin's attitude towards time is rather different from our own. They are very slow people. They don't get ulcers. They're not worried about the watch. I, I suspect it's because I spent so many years in the Middle East, I never wear a watch. And when I do wear a watch, I tend to break them. Um, the Bedouins are that way. They just, you know, take a relaxed look at life. They enjoy life for life's sake. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who spoke about the simplicity of life, would have liked the better one. And finally, uh, I'm always asked, what does the white flag mean? Uh, there are actually two flags that the Bedouins use. You probably got, ought to know what they are. There's the white flag and the black flag. The white flag, in fact, both, both of them are signals to bring people to a tent. The white flag represents joy, any kind of joy. It could mean someone has been married. It could mean that uh, they've had a son or they've had a daughter even. They don't have anything against uh, women, children, I mean, uh, female children. Anything that has to do with happiness, they've had a great crop or whatever. They'll fly the white flag, maybe a lot of white flags. And then when you see that white flag, it's hoped that you will come to the, to the house and you'll go through the coffee tea ceremony and you'll ask them, what happened? what nice thing happened to you. And they'll explain what nice thing happened. There'll be a sharing of news. And then it's expected that you'll go on and you'll share that news uh, in another coffee tea ceremony, perhaps somewhere else in the tribe. It's a way to pass on news. It's a signal flag, in other words. Bedouin semaphore, black flag. Let's say that uh, 
a better one over there did something nasty to me. And I said, look, you really shouldn't have done that to me. He says, well, I don't care about you. You're, I don't like you. And I refuse to repent. And maybe it's not something that's serious enough uh, to bring him into an Orphe court. What I might do is put a black flag just outside his tent. And that's a signal flag that people are to go to him and say, what nasty thing did you do? Now, in summary, I just have to say this. In my experience in studying Bedouins for over 10 years now, that the Bedouins are very interesting people, no matter where they are in the Middle East. Bedouins of the Sinai are different than Bedouins of Saudi Arabia, different than Bedouins of Jordan, different than Bedouins of parts of Israel. But they are basically very good people. And again, as I say, they have a deep sense of art, deep sense of poetry, deep sense of honor, deep sense of courage. And these are all things that we consider in our culture to be things to strive for. So when you see them out there in the desert, think of them from that standpoint. They really are a very civilized people. The code of ethics may be slightly different than our own. Their art may be different than our own. But they really do appreciate all of those things that we consider culture and civilization. Any questions? No questions at all? It's usually some question somewhere. Well, there are a number of different figures, and I, uh, I, I just be guessing. I've heard, the Israelis have got figures, the MFO has some figures. Um, I've heard 80,000, I've heard 100,000, I've heard 200,000. And these are all from people who ought to know. I, I really don't know how the answer to that. You know, during the days of, of the Ottomans, one time this was owned by the Ottoman Empire, what the Turks used to do is that they would come to a Bedouin uh, camp and they would say, well, here's five tents here. Uh, we consider there to be five people per tent, therefore there are 25 people in that particular tribe. And that's how they counted. And then they would tax the people accordingly. The Bedouins, if you ask them how many people in our tribe, are not going to tell you how many people are there because they don't want to be taxed. So no one really knows how many Bedouins there are. And I'd just be guessing. Yes, sir, first person. Uh, can you sp speak up a little bit? I, I can't hear that. Oh, they're going back, they're going to Mecca. Yes, well, it, that's, a sen that's a sense of joy. Uh, one of the obligations of a Muslim is, in fact, to go to Mecca, to go to uh, the, the great mosque there and to Kaaba and so forth. And so they might indeed fly a white flag indicating joy. I either, I've come back probably from Mecca, is what it, they have, a, it's called the Hajj. They go to Mecca and then they come back. And they'll probably fly the white flag when they get back. Uh, if, if they want to, uh, they don't sell women. Okay, I think you were mentioning that they have a, a girl. Uh, well, a lot of people think that you know when their daughter's ready, they're going to sell them. They don't really sell. I mentioned earlier with with um, with marriage that, that you would give two thousand dollars, equivalent two thousand dollars, either in camels or, or money, when you want to marry somebody. You're not really buying the woman. What you're proving is that you have the ability to take care of that woman. You're not just a vagabond out there. You ha you've earned money. You can take care of that woman, you can raise children and raise a household. It's actually a very practical uh, you know, st point of view. And that money comes right back to your family in the form of jewelry for the woman and uh, furniture for the house. It's like a dowry. Yes, sir? How do you obtain a woman? Water. Well, how do you, oh, wealth, sorry. Well, there are lots of different ways, as I say, values are changing. In the um, northern Sinai, the Egyptians or Egyptian government is uh, asking people you know, to grow a great deal. They're growing fruit of all, of all different kinds, vegetables. And the Bedouins have changed the values to a certain extent. They are doing quite a bit of farming. Not all the farmers there are Bedouins, of course. Many of them come from the uh, Nile Delta. They get along very well and they look alike, but they're not Bedouins. But they do, in fact, make money uh, by uh, selling their vegetables and their fruit in the uh, El Arish and Sheikh's the Way market. If you go to the market in uh, El Arish, you go on the main road, go into the, in, the main road, you see a market there. A lot of that stuff was grown by Bedouins. Not all of it, but a lot of it was grown by Bedouins. They make money that way. If, when you're coming into El Arish, as you get past the, uh, the guard point, you'll see some palm groves on both sides. Those are grown by Bedouins. That's owned by a local tribe. 
and they make money selling the wood and selling the, uh, the fruit. They also make money selling rababas. I bought that from a Bedouin, the, uh, wherever it is. And um, I'd like to have it back <laughs> at some point. <laughs> and uh, where well, they sell things. Uh, also smuggling. The Bedouins have been smuggling for thousands of years. They make a lot of money uh, smuggling. They're very, and they're incredibly ingenious when it comes to smuggling. I was reading a report once by one of the British governors of the Sinai, and uh, he was talking about uh, the Bedouins who would come from uh, Bir al-Abd, which is a center for smuggling, has been for as long as its history. And what they would do is they would uh, have boats that would go along the coast here either way. And then a British uh, patrol boat would come up to the smuggling boat. Now, just before the patrol boat would come to the smuggling boat, these folks would drop the hashish off the boat in uh, packages. And inside these packages, in addition to the hashish, would be bricks of salt, large bricks of salt. So the hashish, or whatever it is that they're smuggling, something in the form of a plant, would sink, and the boat goes on, and the coastal boat goes on, and then later on the Bedouin boat comes back, the salt has dissolved, and the hashish floats to the surface. And they go on their merry way, and they sell the hashish. This was a very popular way uh, to do it. They also sometimes would make um, these stone, I forgot the word for it right now, but uh, milling stones. They make a false milling stone, and inside the milling stone they would put hashish, and they would smuggle them across the Rafa. That was very popular back in the 1940s until, uh, until the British caught on to it. So they make money that way as well. Smuggling, they make a lot of money with smuggling. Yes, sir? Uh, most Bedouins only have one wife, surprisingly enough, uh, at a time, however. They may have four or five wives through their lives. And what they do is they, they, a woman's uh, stature in the tribe is not only judged by the way she cooks, the way she takes care of her family and the, uh, her burqa and all that, but also how many children she has. Uh, that's part of her function in life is to have children and expand the tribe and to have hopefully a lot of males as well. The, uh, so what was the rest of your question? How many, how many people how many in a family? I don't have any exact figures in that. I, I know that uh, I mean, I've met a number of families and they'll have uh, five, six children, perhaps more. I've met one family which had three wives, so they do sometimes have several wives at one time. Usually only one wife, however. Yes, sir? Yeah, the Bedouins know a good deal about medicine, um, and they do last a long time. The, uh, the Bedouins will last until their 50s and 60s, 70s, sometimes 80s. So I interviewed a Bedouin about two weeks ago who was 85 years old. Uh, I'll give you an example of Bedouin medicine. I was on a, a mission the other day, and we were given a plant which the uh, Bedouins use for making a tea. They take a small sprig of this, and they put it in a pot and they boil it and you get a sort of a yellow tea which is quite tasty. And what it does is it's like eucalyptus, the, uh, the effect of it. It expands the chest and uh, stops your coughing if you're sick. But also it's just a great tea to have in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, why don't you pass this around? It's got kind of a nice smell. Uh, there are a lot of different plants out there to use for medicine. They, um, but they do make some mistakes. I, I found out recently that, let's say that you've got a, a broken artery. Sometimes I'll put a tourniquet on here. I mean, hopefully they'll always put a tourniquet on there. But they leave it on too long. And you get gangrene in the, in the lower part of the arm, and sometimes they have to cut the arm off. They don't understand. You, you take the tourniquet off once in a while. This, this, I'm thinking more of the Bedouins in the middle of the Sinai than Bedouins up in the north, who are closer to cities. The uh, tea smells better than the bush. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Any changes because of tea? No, TV. Oh, TV. They uh, usually we use 12-volt television sets. 
which are tied into batteries from their car. Although I understand there's a growing industry now in people who charge batteries. They go around to each uh, village and they charge everybody's batteries for a fee to keep the TVs going. Well, of course, the Bedouins do see things on television. Uh, they see a different lifestyle. And some people change. Younger people, as they go to school, are going to change. They're going to want a better life. But you know what's interesting about that? I was in this Bedouin home. There's a fellow now. He's in a suit. He's got a tie on. And he's got shoes and socks. Combs his hair. Doesn't wear anything in the way of typical Bedouin clothing. Yet he's very much a Bedouin. You know, the Bedouin ethics can't meet the wife because it's not proper. Uh, you cross your legs in front of the, uh, you don't eat at the dinner table, you, you sit on the floor, uh, a mat, clean mat. He does, does all these things, he's still a Bedouin. You see manifestations of modern civilization, but the basic culture is still there. They're, they're essentially a Bedouin, and I think they will be. Even if, even if they change the clothes they wear, even if they start having TV sets and radios and tractors and all that, there's still going to be Bedouins just as, a, just as they have been for hundreds of years. But you do see some interesting changes. Uh, for example, there is in the Sinai a sculptor. Now under Islam you don't make statues. But there is a fellow down near uh, Ras, uh, Ras Rani who makes sculptures. Uh, I want to pass this around, but he makes sculptures much like this. I don't know if you can see this or not. It's a reminiscent of sculptures made in Mesopotamia some thousands of years ago. This fellow has been ostracized by his tribe. So the tribe doesn't like what he's doing. The man insists that he, he's seen these things, seen other people make them. He thinks they're beautiful. Even though they're images of people and that's forbidden by Islam, he's going to make them. And so you are seeing little changes. And I, I, this poster here comes from an exhibit of Bedouin sculpture. Uh, in Israel. There are two Bedouin sculptors in all of Israel and the Sinai. One is in uh, this part of Negev near Beersheba. As I said, the other fellow is down near Ras Mizrani. Now that's something which is changing very slowly. So they do appreciate art, they do appreciate poetry, but unfortunately, it's under Islamic law, you don't make images of people. Any other questions? It depends. Uh, if you are a Tuara Bedouin, and these are the Bedouins again who are south up here, this, this line, you don't move very much. In fact, if uh, you're a Jebeliah Bedouin, you don't move at all. You generally live inside the Wadi Quran, Wadi Al Shek area in houses. Those houses you see down there when you're flying through there are Bedouin houses. In the north, they do wander uh, in the central part of the Sinai, and in this part of the Sinai, they wander a good deal. Not so much in this area here, pretty static. Those who wander have ranges of various sizes, maybe uh, 100 miles across, a couple hundred miles across, 50 miles, whatever. They have basic ranges that are between water wells. If you ask a Bedouin where he's from, he's not going to say he's from the Sinai. He's going to say, I am from a certain water well. And there'll be a certain range between water wells that he considers his territory. And that will vary with the, the distance between water wells. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you all for coming here. It gives me a lot of pleasure and gives the COU a lot of pleasure to give this lecture. And the Bedouins are, again, a very civilized, very interesting people which uh, demand and deserve a lot of respect. Their culture is different than ours, their values are different than ours, but really not so very different. And uh, I hope that you will take an opportunity sometime to get to know them. They're not a dangerous people, again, unless you break the rules of behavior. Uh, as, as I say, I'm going to give a copy of my booklet to your training officer and it has a lot more detail about the Bedouins in it. I mean, you could talk for hours and hours and hours about them. Thanks very much.
Oh, maybe the next one, yeah. I'm we giving quite a bit, I imagine. Oh, yeah. Uh, as long as you don't have a mission.